at 1347 hours on December 10th, 2025, over the western coastline of Crimea, Russia activated one of the most layered air defense networks on the planet. Radar screens lit up. Alarms stayed silent. What appeared on the displays didn't fit any known threat profile. They weren't aircraft. They weren't missiles. And yet, 12 minutes later, one of Russia's most strategic transport planes no longer existed. Seven Ukrainian UJ-26 Beaver drones skimmed in from the sea toward Kacha Air Base, just north of Sevastopol. Their objective wasn't damage, it was annihilation. Inside the Panzer S-1 command vehicle, the air smelled of ozone and stress. On the radar screen, reality began to fracture. 38 kilometers offshore, the fire control radar detected seven contacts. The sergeant leaned closer. The data made no sense. They moved at roughly 195 kilometers per hour, yet their radar signature pulsed erratically. One moment, they appeared massive. The next, they vanished entirely. This wasn't a malfunction. The drones were flying barely 15 meters above the waves. Their ferret-coated fuselages absorbed the Pantsir's X-band radar emissions. The targeting algorithm began to struggle. The software couldn't classify something that moved like a light aircraft, but reflected radar like sea clutter. Manual locking was attempted. The system rejected the contacts as noise. Then, at 28 kilometers out, the trap snapped shut. Three drones broke their low-altitude profile and climbed vertically to 2,200 meters. At Apogee, they deployed Lunaberg lenses, simple spherical reflectors designed to massively amplify radar returns. The effect was immediate. On the operator's screen, three faint specks inflated into the signatures of large strategic aircraft diving toward the base. The Panzer's computer, programmed to prioritize the largest perceived threat, reacted instantly. Automatic turrets snapped upward. Inside the vehicle, the operator no longer saw drones. He saw attack vectors, heavy aircraft. Training took over. Large threat. Saturation fire. He pressed the launch command twice. The 30-ton platform shook as 257E6 missiles erupted from their canisters within a second. Solid fuel boosters hurled them forward to Mach 3.8. The shockwave slammed into the chassis as smoke briefly blinded the optics. Now everything depended on mathematics. Radar tracked missiles and targets simultaneously, feeding constant course corrections. An invisible stream of data guiding one projectile toward another. Time to impact. Seven seconds. At altitude, the first decoy drone followed its suicide programming. No evasive maneuvers. It wasn't meant to survive. 15 meters from the target, the proximity fuse triggered. A dense halo of high-velocity metal fragments expanded outward, designed to shred aircraft structures. Against a plastic composite drone, it was extreme overkill. The threatening radar contact vanished. Target destroyed, the operator shouted. Seconds later, the second missile erased the next decoy. Perfect intercepts, textbook execution. The operator exhaled. He didn't realize he had just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to destroy two empty flying shells filled with fuel and reflectors. Ukrainian planners had timed this precisely. They knew exactly how fast the Pantsir would react to a high-value threat. Four seconds passed, just long enough for missile smoke to clear and the radar processor to refresh. The operator smiled, then the screen lit up again. Four new contacts emerged from sea clutter just 12 kilometers out. The real drones had never left. They had waited. Now they scattered violently. One north, one south, two straight toward the base. The operator's face drained of color. The Panzer could track many targets, but it could only engage two at a time. Too many eyes, not enough hands. Desperate, he grabbed the encrypted handset and called the S-400 battery on higher ground. This is where 21st century warfare becomes absurd. Despite satellites, phased array radars, and long-range missiles, target coordination still depended on humans shouting coordinates over a noisy voice line. 30 seconds slipped away. In drone warfare, 30 seconds is a lifetime. The drones exploited the gap. They were too close for the S-400, optimized for high-altitude aircraft, and too dispersed for a single Panzer to stop alone. The Southern Buk M3 battery finally engaged. The operator faced a brutal choice. Four drones remained. If he fired everything, reload time would leave the base exposed for 12 minutes. He selected two flank targets and fired. 
This is where advanced engineering collided with basic physics. The Buch's radar doesn't see continuously. It pulses, like a strobe light in a dark club. To guide missiles against separate targets, the radar had to alternate illumination every half second. During those gaps, the missiles flew blind, trusting prediction. The drones ignored prediction. They moved erratically. Up, down, left, right. No optimization. No logic. One missile exhausted itself chasing a target that never behaved as expected, detonating harmlessly. The other caught a drone that flew straight for a fraction of a second too long. One kill, two magazines gone, three drones remained. Farther inland, they entered the engagement envelope of the S-400 Triumph. This time, the operator was calm. The drones followed the dark line of the coastal road. No radio, no GPS. They navigated visually, using cheap cameras to read contrast. The launch order was given. A seven-meter, multi-million dollar 48N6 class missile thundered into the sky. Built to hunt strategic bombers, now chasing fiberglass. But the system carried a flaw born of its priorities. The S-400 was optimized for fast, high energy targets. The slow, low drone blended into ground clutter between radar scans. The track degraded. Guidance became unreliable. At Mach 6, the missile attempted a correction. Physics refused. The turn exceeded structural limits. The missile overshot and plunged into the sea, throwing a 100-meter column of water skyward. The shockwave from its passage tore the wings off a trailing drone. Carbon fiber disintegrated under compressed air alone. Still, targets remained. The last two drones split. One climbed sharply. Fast, obvious, the operator fired instinctively. The drone vanished. The final UJ-26 did the opposite. It dove toward the 330 kilovolt transmission lines feeding Sevastopol's rail network. This wasn't just flying low. It was environmental electronic warfare. Ionized air around the cables created a cloud of electromagnetic interference. On radar, the corridor was pure static. The operator fired blindly. The missile struck a power tower. The drone slipped through. Three kilometers from the runway, with explosives intact, it exited the interference zone. By 1358, the digital defense network was dead. The S-400 was blind. The Pantsir was empty. The final defense relied on two conscripts manning a ZU-23-2 anti-aircraft gun. Manual cranks, optical sight, technology from the 1960s. They heard it before they saw it. Not a jet. A constant mechanical hum. The drone emerged through heat haze like a black cross. The gunner fired. Both barrels roared, filling the air with tracers. But the drone flew differently. Slow, unafraid. The ammunition ran out. At 1,500 meters, the drone entered its final phase. Inertial navigation ended. Image recognition AI took over. It scanned hangars, parking pads, fuel trucks. Days earlier, a Russian officer had unknowingly geotagged the target on social media. The match was instant. Antonov N26. NATO code COAL. Registration RF36074. The drone rolled into a 45-degree dive. 25 kilograms of thermobaric explosive detonated at the wing root. Fuel vapor ignited. Aluminum vaporized. The fuselage split in two. Secondary explosions lit sensors across Sevastopol. Twelve minutes after detection, the aircraft no longer existed. Not because Russia lacked technology, but because it trusted it too much. Plastic defeated steel, cheap code defeated complexity, and speed alone proved insufficient to win modern wars. Mission complete. End of transmission.